picture of the thoracic diaphragm. Um, and it is, uh, it, this is a picture that you, this is sort of the view you would see if you were standing on the bladder, gazing up lovingly at your thoracic diaphragm. You would see, you would see this and this looks, and, and from underneath this is kind of like a cathedral ceiling you know, or, or looking up at a, a geodesic dome or something like that. It's like, it's a domed ceiling. And, and the diaphragm is a sheet of muscle. And, and actually the definition of a diaphragm is any sheet attached to a frame. Any sheet attached to a frame. So, um, so a, a window is a diaphragm. A, uh, a trampoline is a diaphragm. A sail on a boat is a diaphragm, a parachute is a diaphragm. Any sheet attached to a frame is a diaphragm. Your thoracic diaphragm, oops, oops. Your, your thoracic diaphragm is a sheet of muscle, sorry, is a sheet of muscle attached to the bottom of your sternum, the bottom of your ribs. Here's the tip of your 11th rib out here. Here's the tip of your 12th rib. So it's attached to the bottom of the rib cage. And then you see there's a little suspension bridge from the tip of the 12th rib. And that suspension bridge jumps over this muscle, which is the quadratus. That's what you see here, the suspension bridge, right? That jumps over the quadratus. And you see that suspension bridge attaches to the transverse process. I'm going to Try to bring that in for you. Zoom in. Oh my God, this is this works well. Um, so here is the transverse process. So you see how there are spikes on the side of the vertebra. This is the transverse process of L1. And you see this little suspension bridge allows for this muscle to slide underneath it. This muscle is the psoas, right? These uh. And, and then you see that, oops, sorry. Doop, doop, doop. Maybe I have to shut my window. There we go. You see that this suspension bridge here attaches to the front of the spine. And if you look close, you can see that these tendinous attachments actually climb down the spine all the way to the level of L4. L3 in some books, but L4 in this one. And these tendinous attachments turn into a suspension bridge that goes over the aorta, right? The aorta slips behind it. And some of these fibers, as you can see, come right up and make this loop. See this little loop right here? They make this little loop. You can see there's con it's contiguous from the front of the spine up around this little loop, right back, into the, right back into the tendinous attachments of the diaphragm, you can see that this little loop allows for your esophagus to travel from your chest through your chest cavity and into your abdomen. So, um, so this little loop actually is your lower esophageal sphincter. It's what keeps food from coming back up, right? It's, this is what helps keep you from having reflux. This hole here is for your vena cava. That's the big vein that brings blood back from the extremities to your heart. Um, now, what I want you to pay particular attention to for, the per for our purposes today is I want you to pay particular attention to the back part of the diaphragm, this part. I want you to, and if you want, you know, you can pull up for the remainder of this talk. Shoot, my goodness. Uh, for the remainder of this talk, you can maybe pull up one of these images. You can just Google Netter images, thoracic diaphragm, and this guy will pop up. And just try and make it a screensaver for yourself for a while. Because you should make a photograph of this in your mind. Imprint, the, especially the back part of your diaphragm in your mind. If you want to make good use of it, that's a great thing to do. Um, but it's the back part we're going to really focus on today because it's the back part 
on people that has generally gone to sleep a long time ago. So I'll put that down. Now let me tell you, again, this is like looking up at a cathedral ceiling, right? It's like looking up at a little cathedral ceiling or a big cathedral ceiling rather. So it's shaped like this. Your diaphragm is shaped like this. Let's say that this is your, um, wait, maybe if I do it like this, it'd be better. Yeah, sure. Your diaphragm is shaped, is shaped like this. It's a dome when it's relaxed. Remember, it's a muscle. So a muscle can relax and a muscle can contract. So a muscle can relax and a muscle can contract. When this muscle is relaxed, the muscle fibers are long. That's, that's you know, what a relaxed muscle is. It's a long muscle. When a muscle contracts, muscle fibers slide past each other. They grab onto each other and slide past each other to shorten. That's how they contract. That's how they do their work. So your diaphragm, when it's relaxed, is shaped like a dome or a parachute. When it contracts, the muscle fibers slide past each other and shorten. And when they do, your diaphragm flattens. It goes from being shaped like a parachute, parachute, being shaped like a drum head. A drum head is also a diaphragm, right? But it's a flat diaphragm with more tension in the sheet. So when it's relaxed, it goes, when it's shaped like a dome. When it contracts, it flattens. Now, my arms swung out to the side. Why? That's because when it flattens, everything that's underneath it, everything that's in the belly is going to get smushed and it's going to get smushed into the floor of your pelvis, right? And when it, when it gets smushed, it's going to squish outward, like an exercise ball will squish if you sit on it. Simultaneously, when you flatten the diaphragm, right? You're going to enlarge the chest, uh, chest cavity. The chest cavity, this area, this area above my hands, when, it, when you flatten the diaphragm, you just added this much space to it in my particular uh, interpretive dance, right? You just added volume to your diaphragm, when you, to your chest cavity when you flatten your diaphragm. And when you add volume, that's like opening a bellows, right? That's what, if you open a bellows, if those of you who might not know what a bellows is, they're this little device, maybe you've seen them in cartoons, and you open and close them, and there's like a bag and you blow air out and suck air in and blow air out because you're trying to stoke a fire. That's, that's what a, a bellows is. So when you flatten your diaphragm and enlarge the chest cavity, that's like opening a bellows. You make it larger inside and that drops the pressure. It creates a vacuum. And so air is going to come in to the chest cavity. The lower pressure in the chest cavity, air is going to rush into that from the external environment. And we call that inhalation. When you exhale, you are relaxing your diaphragm. And when you relax your diaphragm, here's our contracted diaphragm. When you relax your diaphragm, the muscle fibers slide past each other in the other direction and they elongate. And the diaphragm it goes back to being a dome, right? And when it does, the internal organs lift up underneath it like little skydivers. Little skydivers rising up underneath the diaphragm, the opening parachute. And so the belly goes from being smushed outward to appearing to be more narrow. And when that, and simultaneously, when you do this, the volume of the chest cavity, because all the other boundaries of the chest cavity are basically fixed, all the boundary, the, the volume of the chest cavity gets smaller as the diaphragm domes back up. And when that happens, that's like closing your bellows. When you close the bellows, you make it smaller inside. And when it gets smaller inside, the pressure goes up. And as a result, air will go out. Um, so your diaphragm is a pump that moves air into and out of the chest cavity. And it is simultaneously a pump that moves fluid into and out of the chest cavity. 
So blood that's in your veins, lymphatic fluid, sinus drainage even, all of these fluids will return towards your chest cavity every time you inhale. When you exhale and your diaphragm relaxes and makes your chest cavity small in volume, then the pressure goes up and actually your diaphragm helps the heart to pump blood out of the arteries, out of the heart into the arteries. It helps the heart's pumping. It contributes significantly to cardiac output. So the diaphragm coordinates basically all the fluid return and contributes significantly to cardiac output. So that means our diaphragm has a circulatory function. Um, and we don't normally think about it that way. Uh, we, think about, we think about the diaphragm as just being something that we use to move air in and out. We don't really, um, and we think about that the heart does all the work of circulation. But the truth is the heart really only contributes to the cardiac output. Once you get pat into the capillaries, the heart doesn't really do much, much to contribute anymore to moving fluid in the body. So, so the diaphragm is actually the primary driver of circulation in the body. And, um, and this is really tends to be surprising and um, surprising news to most people um, because we don't normally think about it that way. In fact, um, you know, when I've, when I've taught doctors to breathe, doctors who are not osteopaths in particular, um, they're, they always go, wow, yeah, I didn't think about it, it makes perfect sense. Because look at the stroke volume of the diaphragm. Um, stroke volume of the diaphragm, basically your liver takes up most of this, uh, more than half of the space under your diaphragm. But think about how big the liver is. Not the whole diaphragm, there's stomach, spleen, pancreas over here. But this side is mostly liver. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna figure out the technology, folks. I'm gonna make you a better slideshow. But for now, understand that most of this space is, has liver underneath it. But do you realize how big the liver is? Liver is huge. The liver is, I was trying to find a good, uh, a, a better calculation for it. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's, it's probably a, a good, you know, it's definitely three times bigger than the heart itself. So it dwarfs the size of the heart, this, you know, and, and, and that doesn't even, that liver size doesn't even take up all the space under the diaphragm. So the stroke volume of the diaphragm dwarfs the size of the heart and even more so dwarfs the size of the heart chambers. So it makes sense that this plays a huge role in moving fluids inside the body as well as air into and outside of the body. And I think you're going to uh, feel that as we, as we progress through that. So... The really good news about this is that this is a skeletal muscle. It's amenable to your conscious control, right? We can take better breaths just by, um, just with intention. You know, people can take a deeper breath, uh, you know, very, you know, just take a deep breath. Somebody can do it. Even if they're, you know, restricted in a lot of places, they'll, they can, they can change the size of their breath at will. But if they, if they learn how to operate this uh, machinery, they're going to be able to make huge changes in the size of their breath. And the reason this is wonderful is because better fluid return is better physiology, right? This is what's coordinating fluid return and better fluid return is better physiology. And now I'm going to give you my little sales pitch on why I think you should practice this. Um, what we're about to do today, at least um, on a daily basis, honestly, as often as you think about it, and definitely for the first nine breaths when you wake up every morning. I want you to just practice just breathing with your thoracic diaphragm. Um, but uh, here's my sale, here's my, my reasons why. So in order to do that, let's, let's talk about lymph. Um, lymph is... Uh, you know, we, we said blood in the veins, lymphatic fluid, sinus drainage. We're all pretty familiar with blood. We know where it is, what it looks like, what it does, what it's doing for us, for the most part, in, in some terms anyway. 
um, but not many of us know much about lymph. And yet, and I would say that's even true for physicians. Physicians don't pay much attention to lymph at all. Um, unless, unless things are, unless there's very advanced pathology. But the lymph, when it comes to your health, is just as important as blood. From one perspective, we could say that the lymph arises from the blood. As the blood is passing through the capillary bed, uh, and the capillaries um, uh, are these little microscopic vessels that are a bridge between your arteries and your veins. Um, and and they, because the arteries get smaller and smaller as they travel away from the heart, and then they get to the capillaries, which are really small and really thin. And because they're so thin, their walls are semi-permeable. And because they're semi-permeable, oxygen and carbon dioxide can trade places. You can have gas exchange there. So we can get new oxygen. We can dump the carbon dioxide. But these thin-walled capillaries, while they don't allow, because, because while these thin-walled capillaries don't allow the red blood cells to leak outside the blood vessels. They still allow for the plasma, which is the clear fluid that the red blood cells are suspended in, this clear fluid can leak through the capillary wall. And once it has leaked through the capillary wall, we call it lymph. And lymph is the vehicle that brings things to your cells that your cells want to need. It's the delivery system, nutrients and fats, proteins, all the things that your cells need to continue your processes of met metabolism and cell repair and cell replication. All of these things, you know, are there, it's, it's nourished by the lymph. Um, and it's also the lymph, is like a, you can think of the lymph as a fluid matrix of the body. I always think of Venice, you know, when I think of, of the lymphatic system because, you know, people get around by boats, or at least this is how it is in my mind. I've never been there to Venice, that is. But, you know, people get around everywhere on the water, which has always seemed rather appealing to me to get around by the water. But, uh, so your immune system has to get to places outside of your bloodstream, and the way it does that is through the fluid matrix of the body which is the lymphatic system. And this lymphatic, this lymphatic fluid, this is also this, this fluid in the spaces between your cells. This fluid is also the, um, the means by which your cells um, get rid of metabolic waste. It's where they dump the waste products of your biochemistry. You know, all the cell, all the chemical reactions happening in your, in your cells um, they all produce stuff that your cells need to maintain your body, but they're also producing stuff that your body can't use anymore, or at least can't use in its current form. So it needs to be returned to the circulation. It has escaped from the blood vessels into the extracellular space, and now it needs to come back to the heart. So the longer... Like if, if, if you have some blood that's moving through your body and it leaks through your capillaries, let's say in your foot, and once it's in the space around your foot, right? Once it's in the, in the spaces between the cells in your foot, now it has to return. It's not going to go back in the blood vessels to do that. It has to come up through the spaces between the cells, like, like water trickling through pebbles, you know, or sand or something, or on the edges of the street like contributing to streams from mountainsides and springs. Water has to move through things, through the cells to make it back to circulation. If it doesn't move very fast, or if it, it's stagnant in your foot, the area becomes congested with lymph because more plasma continues to leak out of your blood vessels, and yet the lymph continues to sit there and not move very much. Like let's say somebody is bedridden or something like that and their legs can become swollen under those circumstances. But when this happens, when the lymph is congested, now you have a situation where there is in the 
in the environment of the cells, there is a low concentration, there's a, a, a increasingly depleted concentration of nutrients and fats and proteins and all the things your cells want. There is an increasingly gummy uh, matrix for your immune system to travel through. And there is an increasingly high concentration of metabolic waste product. As the concentration of waste product goes up in the extracellular space, it becomes increasingly difficult for cells to get rid of that waste product from within their membranes because now you have a high concentration of waste product outside the cell. That produces what we call a concentration gradient. For those of you who may not remember that term from high school, um, a gradient is the natural, is a tendency in nature for things to go from high to low. So if I have this uh, picture here and I hold it up like this, if I let go of it, it's not going to fly up to the ceiling, it's going to drop because it is going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Things in nature like to go from high energy states to lower energy states. If I open that uh, a door in winter um, and I, uh, I, I will let all the heat, the high temperature inside the house rush out into the cold outside. It will go from high temperature to low temperature. If, if the situation's reversed, where there's cold inside the house, where you've got the AC running in the house and you've got hot outside, if you open the door, the heat from the outside will run inside. It will go in the downhill direction. The same is true with concentration. So if I take some salt um, and, and drop it into water, it's not going to stay in that one spot. It's going to disperse. It's going to go to the lowest concentration. It will go from high concentration to low concentration. That's a natural direction. If I want to take this picture and I want to take it up higher, I have to put work into it. I have to put energy into it to lift it up high. So if there's a high concentration of waste product, if the trash can is too full, then it's harder to put more trash into it. And that means the cells are going to have to use more energy, which is your energy, to, put more, uh, to, to push more waste product out. Or if they get behind on that project, then they're going to develop a high concentration of waste product inside the cell membrane. And when that happens, now that's going to have a deleterious effect on the reaction, on your reactions of life, on your biochemistry. It's going to slow down your metabolism because, because reaction speeds and, and, uh, and reactions are governed by the conditions of the reaction, right? As well as the inherent qualities of a reaction itself. It's, it, it, it's a rea some reactions go faster when it's hot, right? Uh, gasoline won't burst into flames unless you put a little heat into it, right? But if it's cold, it can stay like, if, if it doesn't get heat, it's, it'll stay as gasoline, right? The reactions will change their speed and, and even if they're gonna go at all, based on what the environment is. And that environment includes temperature, it includes pressure, it includes concentration of other chemicals around, or concentration of the chemicals involved in a reaction. So, um, and, 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 and I, I will be available to answer questions about this, but um, maybe you all could just give me a little like hand indication if most of you are following me on this part. Yeah, yeah, super, let me see. Let me see, yes, okay. Some of you I can't see, beautiful, thank you. All right, excellent. So, um, so now we're, we're, uh, we're, 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 we're getting to the point that if we are not clearing waste product from our tissues effectively, we are slowing down our reactions of life. We are decreasing our vitality. We are using energy to try to deal with the waste, pro with the waste management problem in the, in the extracellular space that, um, that we could be using for lots of other things, basically. So, um, so it's very important to clear waste product from the tissues. Um, 
Anything that's congested with lymph in your body will be stiff, stiffer, will be stiff, like a plant stem is stiff when it's full of fluid, right? Which is great if you're a plant stem. It's not so great if you're human tissue stuffed with uh, lymphatic fluid that has a high concentration of waste product. Um, it will probably be painful or at least tender. Even just the pressure on your tissues alone can cause pain. You know, for many people, they can have terrible imaging studies indicating they have terrible arthritis, but as long as they're not acutely inflamed, they might not have any pain at all. It's when, it's when there is congestion and inflammation in the area that the area becomes very, very painful. And finally, uh, it will always lack the vitality that it could have if it was not congested. So it's very important to clear waste product from your tissues. And the main thing that does that is your thoracic diaphragm. Um, and so that's why we're going to do our best to um, uh, get uh, much better control of it today. And um, to that end, well, I actually don't have anyone to help me do this here today. So I'm not going to do my little wave demonstration through a diaphragm. I'm just going to have to tell you about it. Um, and so we can go ahead and have, if, as, is anybody else, is everybody else out there uh, just one person in a room or are there, does anybody else have a friend with them? Just two of you as far as I can tell. Okay, okay, all right. So if you have a friend, um, then lie down on the floor uh, about this far from your friend where this hand could be on their back between their, uh, at their, place where their lumbar and their thoracic um, uh, spine begin, kind of on the border of the diaphragm. So you wanna be able to lie down on the floor with your arm, able to rest on the hand of your friend next to you. If you're alone, you might want to take some sort of uh, thing, like, like a piece of cloth or something like this. You know, I got this little sweatshirt. Oh, Monoma. Um, and you can take something like this. Um, at Shemen Studio at the Pilates Room, you can buy these little blue balls that are very squishy. I think that they're excellent for helping somebody practice breathing um, when, uh, with, you know, with no help because what we wanna be able to do is help you draw your awareness to certain parts of your body so that you can um, learn how to recruit all the muscles that you need uh, all the fibers that you need to make things happen. So you can take something like this and you can put it across your back right here, right? You want it to be relatively thin because you don't want it to put an arch in your back. You want your back to be able to be flat. So what we're gonna do is everybody is going to lie down flat on their back. If you have a friend that you can lie next to, that's great. If not, then um, just try to lay down supine. Everything else I'm gonna be doing from here on out, you won't need to see me. Um, so you can just recline. It's great to have something under your knees so that you don't have to hold your knees up. So um, if you need to, go grab a pillow or uh, a couple pillows from your bedroom or something, uh, bolsters, put them under your knees so that your knees can be uh, uh, bent a little bit and your back can be flat on the floor. Um, uh, this is something that, uh, that Piper from Burlington Yoga always wants me to make sure I tell people because in our modern life, we have such tight psoas muscles that, um, that just lying down flat puts most people's backs in hyperextension. Um, but uh, as we get better and better control over breathing, we're gonna be able to work that out also. So let's see, it looks like almost everybody is um, reclining at this point. Um, so we can go ahead and start. So let's have you um, go ahead and lay down flat on your back um, with your knees slightly raised. And I want you to start breathing from the bottom of your pelvis up to the top of your chest and emptying yourself from the top of your chest down to the bottom of your pelvis. And uh, remembering that the most important instruction when you're practicing breathing 
is to let it be as easy as possible, to let it be relaxed, to let it be something that is softly expansive. It's almost as if you're not going to do anything yourself, as if you're just going to allow the universe to breathe through you. One way you can see that you're breathing from the bottom of the pelvis up to the top and the top down to the bottom is to go ahead and put one hand on your abdomen and put the other hand on your chest. Rest them there for a few breaths. And as you inhale, you're going to lift the bottom hand first with your breath, followed by the top hand in a smooth wave-like motion from the bottom to the top. And when you exhale, you're going to empty from the top back down to the bottom. So the top hand will collapse first and then the bottom hand. Now the only muscle that you need to move in order for you to get your best breath is your thoracic diaphragm. The diaphragm is a sheet of muscle attached to the bottom of the ribs, the bottom of the sternum and the front of the spine. I want you to bring your mind to the borders of the diaphragm where you know it's attached to the bottom of the ribs, the bottom of the sternum and the front of the spine. And I want you to notice the sensations of motion that you have there as you inhale and exhale. I want you to notice that breathing produces changing sensations at the borders of the diaphragm. Inhalation feels slightly different from exhalation. The sensations of inhalation are the sensations of contraction. The sensations of exhalation are the sensations of relaxation. I want you to notice where you are experiencing these changing sensations. For those of you who are doing this for the first time, you probably notice that you feel most of the sensations of breathing on the front of your body and not much sensation, if any at all, on the back. From my experience, I have found that most people have no sensation of breathing on the back of their body at all. What I want you to do now though, is I want you to bring your mind to the posterior border of the diaphragm where you know it's attached. If you haven't put that piece of cloth underneath your back, um, please do so for a moment. If you have a friend with you, go ahead and take turns, um, you know, taking a couple breaths each with uh, your friend's hand on your back where your diaphragm is. See if you can. Bring your mind to the back borders of the diaphragm. Remember that the diaphragm attaches to the bottom of the sternum, the bottom of the rib cage. It attaches to the side of the first lumbar vertebra, and it attaches to the front side of the spine all the way down to L4. If you're not sure where L4 is on your body, you can touch your navel. You can draw your finger around to the top of your hip. And if you continue, drawing your finger around your body, then what you'll uh, bump into when you get to the spine is your fourth lumbar vertebra. So your diaphragm comes all the way down to the place behind your navel on the back of your body. On the front of your body, it only comes down to your sternum. So most of the muscle fiber of your diaphragm is on the back of your, di on the back of your body. And interestingly enough, it's the place we actually need more compression and release. So let's bring our mind back there. Trust me, you have so much more muscle fiber on the back of your diaphragm. My guess is it's probably at least twice as much muscle fiber on the back of the diaphragm as there is on the front. So bring your mind back there. And I want you to try to generate, as you reach for it with your nervous system, and attempt to generate the sensations of contraction on the back of your body and try to push that piece of cloth off your back as you inhale. 
Try to fill up the back of your body as you inhale. Asking those fibers to participate on inhalation. I think that, uh, that you'll notice that if you just bring your mind to the back of the diaphragm, even if I'm not there to touch you or your friend's not there to touch you, all, you can just generate more sensation back there by just bringing your mind there. Go ahead and try to push that thing off your back, whether it's a hand or a strip of cloth or one of those little blue balls, try to push it right off your back and you're gonna generate a lot of sensation across the back of your body, like a band for those of you who are watching this at some later date. It's a band right across here, right? The diaphragm comes down to here in the back. And the band of sensation should light up right across the bottom of your ribs with inhalation. Now, everywhere that you just generated sensation is a place where a muscle fiber contracted. So relax it. This is kind of like one of those meditation practices that, or relaxation practices, you know, uh, self-hypnosis, whatever, where you tighten things up and then so that it's easier for you to let them go because when you tighten them, you generate sensation in them and it, and it alerts your nervous system to where the muscle fibers are. And then when you relax and when you, when you let go, you're, you can relax so much more deeply because you're aware of where the muscle fibers are. So take the nice big breaths, try to push the uh, strip off of your back and then notice where you feel the sensation across your back. And then as you exhale, try to use that sensation so that you can know where to send your signal to relax and relax everything that you contracted. Let go of everything that you contracted. Now, some of you probably opened your mouth to let go of that breath because it felt really big, bigger than usual. If you are recruiting the muscles, muscle fibers on the back of your diaphragm for the first time, your breath is going to feel bigger than usual. But now we're going to make your exhalation easier because you, if, if those of you who opened your mouth, opened your mouth because you were afraid you were going to spray the world like a leaf blower if you made all of that pressure come out of your nose. And those of you who didn't open your mouth, um, who are doing this for the first time, probably sort of braced your chest a little bit so that you wouldn't spray the world like a leaf blower through your nose. Um, but I wanna make your exhalation get easier um, right now. And so in order to do that, I want you to imagine that you have a row of organ pipes that come down the back of your body to the level of your thoracic diaphragm, the level of that band of sensation you generated across the back of your body. I want you to imagine that you have a row of organ pipes that come down to that level and they go right up out the top of your head, neck and shoulders. And they are large and shiny and unobstructed so that when you inhale and generate all that pressure in your chest, you don't have to feel like you have to release that pressure through the two little holes in your face. I want you to imagine you could release that pressure directly into the atmosphere above your head right through the organ pipes. So all you have to do is relax. Some of you may want also wanna play with the idea of just imagining you could simply disperse that breath directly into the air right through your chest wall, especially the back of your chest wall, right? Because that's really where, you, where most of the pressure change should happen on a big breath. So imagine, you could just release that pressure either through the organ pipes or directly through the wall of the chest. And I think most of you will be amazed at how when you do this, that huge, uh, that huge amount of pressure that was in your chest um, only seems to trickle out of your nose. 
And the more deeply you dive into relaxation with each exhalation, I think you'll find that um, the exhalations become softer, quieter, easier when you just use exhalation, uh, uh, relaxation to generate the force of exhalation. Um, You may even imagine, wow, there's a feather right underneath my nose. And when I release through the organ pipes, when I simply allow the exhalation to disperse, that feather doesn't even move when I exhale. It's so soft and quiet and easy. So now we should be, have very easy exhalations. Um, and it's just a lovely feeling to exhale in this fashion. So do this whenever you feel like you need to. But now let's improve the inhalation. So if you, um, so what, I, what we're gonna do first is I'm going to give you an image to work with here. I want you to remember when you played with a parachute when you were little. Um, for those of you who did not play with the parachute, um, this was a phenomena that started after World War II, probably in the 70s when they distributed all the old World War II parachutes around to all the schools. Um, but we always used to, we would we'd play with the, these parachutes in gym class and everybody would hold on to the edge of a parachute and you could, all the kids could shake their edge up and down and generate lots of waves in the parachute. Sometimes you could even throw a ball into the parachute and, or several balls and they would all bounce all over the place in different directions every time they landed on the parachute hitting a different wave going in a different direction. Because those waves, when everybody's waving their arms around, crash into each other and cancel each other out often. They, most of those waves don't make it to all the other edges of that diaphragm. However, if the only person holding the edge of that parachute is you, and you're the only one to generate a wave in that parachute, then that wave will ripple out to all the other borders of that parachute and touch everybody else's hands. And you won't have to do anything else besides start it. All you had to do was flick your wrists and you made a wave that traveled all like several feet away from you. Probably, you know, could, I mean, you can travel across a whole pond, right? You could travel a huge area and all you have to do is start it because diaphragms have a natural capacity to ripple, right? Diaphragms act like diaphragms and they have a natural capacity to ripple. In fact, the reason that a surface, the reason that water ripples is because the surface tension on the water, which is increased hydrogen bonding, is a sheet of increased bond, bonding between the hydrogen aspect of each water molecule is greater on the surface. And so it forms a sheet of increased hydrogen bonding that water striders can walk on, right? And, and the reason that it ripples though is because that sheet is attached to the edge of the body of water, the edge of the glass. And so it's a diaphragm, so it ripples. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take advantage of the natural capacity of a diaphragm to ripple. And we're going to do that by starting the breath on the back of the body. So if you've got a hand for a friend, put it back underneath their body, take turns doing that. If you have your strip there, we're gonna use that, your breathing strip, call it a breathing strip. Um, if you have a breathing strip, um, what I want you to do is I want you to start the breath by filling in that one area on your body and then I think what you'll notice is if you just start it there, kind of like you just start a pinball game by pulling back the plunger. If you imagine that plunger area is right on your back, then start the breath there and then let it travel through the rest of the diaphragm. Let the ripple have a life of its own and see if you can feel that ripple travel around to all the other borders of the diaphragm. 
and it kind of does it by itself, right? All you had to do was start it, just like when you were playing with the parachute. All you have to do is start the breath on your back. And so that initial little impulse of, of, of exertion, um, all you have to do after that is let the wave move through and it will do the work for you. It will fill your chest for you. Feel it ripple all the way around the borders of the diaphragm. Feel it ripple up to the top of the chest, lifting the shoulders. Not because you're contracting muscles up there, but simply because your chest cavity is getting larger in volume, or your, your torso grows in volume as you inhale. And so your shoulders lift up because the pressure inside is expanding the chest cavity. And then of course, everywhere you generated sensation, relax. And now let's get more specific. Now let's start the breath on the spine itself. So if you have a friend there, you know, take your fingertips and put them right on the little bumps of the lumbar spine, right? Right between uh, L4 and L1. Just rest your fingers. You don't have to be super precise. Just be on that midline of your friend's back. Um, if if, if you wish, um, if you have a little strip, you could put it vertically over the same part of your vertebra, if you wish. Um, and then go ahead and start your breath now on that little strip. On that little strip of spine, start it there and then feel it ro radiate out from that one strip. And I think that most of you will notice that that produces a cleaner experience of that wave traveling through the chest. And it, it makes it a little bit easier to get the whole thing started when you start it in a, much, in a very specific place. So now let's get even more specific and let's start the breath on L3 or L4 where the most inferior attachment of the diaphragm is. Start it there. So for those of you with a friend, you can start it on the vertebra right behind their navel. And then you're going to feel it roll like a wave is gonna roll up the spine and touch all the other fingers on the way in a wave-like fashion and then ripple out. If you have a strip, you can put the strip vertically and start the wave on the bottom and feel it roll up the spine, kind of like an inchworm or something like that. Um, or if there it feels, it feels kind of like if you tie a, a rope to a doorknob and flick it. So feel that, that flick travel up your spine. And then once it gets to the level of the rest of the diaphragm, it ripples outward through the muscle belly of the diaphragm rippling around, touching all the borders of the chest cavity. And you may even notice this. Let's just call your awareness to the fact that when you start it on the spine and roll it up the spine, you start it on the spine and roll it up the spine, you might even be able to, over time anyway, notice that you feel a band of sensation go right up from the spine right up to the top of the dome of the diaphragm. And you may even feel like you can feel a loop of sensation that goes right around your esophagus. So it goes right up the spine, right through the muscle belly of the diaphragm, and it loops around the esophagus, just posterior, just behind that central tendon, right? So, if you can, if you can, there's no reason you can't feel anything in your body you want to feel, except you haven't spent enough time putting your awareness there. So the more time you put your awareness here, the more you're going to be able to feel that little loop of sensation go right up to the top of the diaphragm. And then of course, we relax everything completely. It's very important to relax completely between inhalations. If you only close your bellows halfway, you'll only get a half stroke in. And that, as we know, gives you plenty of oxygen. You really don't need that much oxygen. You don't need to ventilate that much. 
in order to have 100% oxygen saturation of your blood. What you won't get from a, 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 a not so great breath, what you won't get from a not so great breath is good fluid return. And it's, so the big advantage of better breathing is better fluid return and better fluid return is better physiology. Absolutely, without a doubt. So now we have found a way to recruit the entire thoracic diaphragm and we found a way to do it very easily. And we found that we only really have to start the breath for the most part. Most of the rest of inhalation is allowing that wave of contraction to mature through the whole body. And we've also found that exhalation is 100%, a good exhalation will be 100% relaxation. The mo probably the most efficient the most efficient exhalation will be 100% relaxation. So my, um, my guesstimation here is that uh, probably more than 97% of good breathing is allowing. It's not go-getting. It's allowing the breath to move the tissues. It's allowing the wave to mature fully through the whole body and move all the tissues, move the fluid, bring it home recycle it, reprocess it, redistribute it, excrete it, do whatever needs to happen to it, right? The body will handle that on its own. So now that we're using the whole thoracic diaphragm, what I'd like you to do is bring your awareness into your abdomen. And I want you to notice that breathing produces changing sensations in the abdomen. Inhalation feels different from exhalation. And I think what you'll notice is that um, the changing sensations that are generated inside the abdomen feel very similar to the sensations you would feel if you were standing in the tide. When a wave comes in, it pressurizes your organs and pushes them towards the pelvic shore. When that wave goes out, you feel a sense of drawing on your organs as they are drawn back up towards your head. Just like you would feel on your body as a wave recedes back out into the ocean, you feel a sense of drawing, pulling your body back out to the water as the wave recedes. I think you'll notice that the more you allow your awareness to rest inside your abdomen, the more you can become aware of sensations of motion and they can become increasingly vivid. The more you allow your awareness to rest in there, you don't really need to have any special yogi chi master training, right? You just let your mind rest there. You allow your awareness to be immersed in those sensations in your abdomen and they will become increasingly vivid to you, especially if every time you exhale, you relax more deeply than the time before. If you relax more deeply than the time before, that means that you are relaxing a few more fibers of your diaphragm. And that means your diaphragm is going up just a little higher in your chest. And that is going to Every time you relax more deeply with exhalation, you're going to find that more air leaves your chest. The more air leaves your chest, the more easily you can get a bigger, better, more satisfying inhalation on your next breath in. What I think you'll also notice is that that sense of drawing that's becoming increasingly vivid inside your abdomen starts to move deeper and deeper into your pelvis the more deeply you relax with each exhalation. This is another direct relationship. You will generate more movement the more deeply you relax your diaphragm. And these organs need movement. They need to be compressed on inhalation because it squeezes all of the old poopy lymphatic fluid out of them. And they need to be released on exhalation 
Oh, and by the way, when they get squeezed is right when the chest cavity is generating vacuum pressure to pull the fluid back to the chest cavity. When you exhale, they can draw in fresh fluid and they can draw more fluid up or back from the periphery with that decompression. So let your organs move. I, I would actually put it out there to those of you who practice yoga or qigong or anything like that. When you're stretching when, or any type of endeavor, if you're stretching, don't just try to stretch a muscle. See what kind of motion and movement you can generate in your internal organs. Most of your muscular stiffness is actually a result of your muscles trying to protect your stiff organs. So try to move your organs around. And the best way to do that, obviously, is with your thoracic diaphragm, compressing and releasing them and making them more supple with each breath. And at some point, you're going to relax so deeply that even though you can continue relaxing, you've noticed that the air stops moving. And you may notice that the air has stopped moving for a long time before you are done relaxing. I really want to encourage you to relax as thoroughly as possible between inhalations. Don't compress, don't squeeze, don't hold your breath. But if you're still relaxing, continue relaxing. If you're still relaxing, then uh, continue to explore the beautiful, open, spacious place between exhalation and inhalation. It's a beautiful, very quiet, peaceful place. And the truth is, if you're still relaxing, you're still elongating fibers. And so the diaphragm is continuing to dome up and it's continuing to generate force from the pressure gradient change. So even if you, the air has stopped moving, it's still moving fluid for you. The fluid is still moving. In fact, you're probably, I'm, uh, you're going to be moving more fluid when the air is not moving. Because if both fluid and air are moving, that means all the, the force you've generated was divided between air and fluid. Now, it's when you're in the space between, that we think of as between exhalation and inhalation, in the apparent pause or the pseudo pause between exhalation and inhalation. You're only having to move fluid because you've moved as much air as you can. So now we're going to be using all the force for fluid motion rather than fluid and air. So take advantage of that, move all the fluid you can. So now I want you to see if you can relax so deeply that that sense of drawing drops right through the abdomen all the way past your navel and goes right for the pelvic floor. And when it touches the pelvic floor, you'll feel a slight lift in the floor of the pelvis. Like your body is doing a slight, spontaneous, effortless little kegel. When the pelvic floor lifts at the end of exhalation, it can be the last thing to contribute positive pressure to your chest cavity. because it lifts up your internal organs, which lift into your thoracic diaphragm, which make your chest cavity get a little smaller, generating a little more potential for a better breath on your next inhalation. When it drops, which is what it does right after it lifts, it can be the first thing to generate negative pressure because it's going to pull down on your internal organs, which will pull down on your thoracic diaphragm, which will pull down which will start to generate the negative pressure in your chest cavity as it makes your chest cavity larger. So now your pelvic floor is participating in moving air and fluid in your body. And it can do that because your pelvic floor is the pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic floor is a sheet of muscle, skin, and fascia attached to the bottom of your uh, attached to the, the ring of your pelvis, the, the inferior ring of your pelvis, 
midline ring of your hips. Right. So your pelvic floor is also a diaphragm. It's a sheet of muscle skin and fascia with some holes in it. And if you're having a hard time find, finding the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, what I want you to do is I want you to squeeze the muscles you would squeeze if you had to pee. Give them a little squeeze just to wake up your awareness of them. And now give the muscles that would stop you from having a bowel movement a little squeeze. So that's, so the muscles that stop you from urinating are the front third, it's not really third, but the front portion, uh, first of three portions of, of the pelvic floor. And the, um, the muscles that keep you from having a bowel movement are the posterior, um, this is the posterior part of the pelvic floor. Now I want you to try it with your mind to locate the muscles that form a strip between the front and the back and see if you can squeeze those. So those are the three parts of the pelvic floor. If you squeeze, give them all a little squeeze together, that's your whole pelvic floor lifting up. Now, I don't think it's a great idea or actually my understanding is it's not a great idea to practice doing kegels or mua bonds when you're supine. I'm not really sure why, but my teacher told me that one time, and I don't even know if he was serious about it or if he was just saying that. Um, but um, so I don't. I, I tell people not to actively lift the pelvic floor while you're supine, I, I, and and so I only want you to do this a couple times. Maybe, maybe do it once or twice at the beginning of of your practice, if your pelvic floor is congested, giving it a couple squeezes will help it become more supple because you'll squeeze the stiff lymphatic, the stiffening lymphatic fluid from there. It'll make it softer. So it'll be easier for you to move it. But I wouldn't want you to, um, every breath, squeeze your pelvic floor. We're not trying to do that. We're not trying to do that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to relax so deeply, trying to relax the thoracic diaphragm so deeply that the pelvic floor has no choice but to go along. It has, it has to go up along with the rest of the organs. And when it does, it will, it will uh, finish off your exhale and then initiate your inhale, pretty much. So now we have two diaphragms working instead of part of one. So now what I want you to do is bring your awareness to the space between your collarbone, your scapula, and your neck. This includes your neck to some, this includes your neck as well. But the shoulder girdle is also a diaphragm. And I want you to notice that when you allow that ripple to travel around to all the borders of the diaphragm, it also travels up to the top of the chest and it will lift that area between your collarbone, your scapula, and your neck. The shoulder girdle is a diaphragm attached to the clavicle, the scapula, the neck, uh, I'm sorry, the, front, the, front, the cervical spine, the base of the cranium, and the hyoid bone, and, and I guess what's also, uh, and, and also um, to ribs and the top of the sternum as well. Um, so the shoulder girdle, is a diaphragm and when you feel it expand on inhalation a little bit at the top of inhalation and when you feel it collapse at the beginning of exhalation now you're breathing with three diaphragms instead of just one it's actually probably more like 2.5 because the shoulder girdle for a lot of people is pretty stiff in the back um, but as you continue to breathe it will loosen up um, and, and you'll get more motion back there um, and, and we'll look more closely at all the individual diaphragms in the future. Um, that's my intent. So now what I want you to do, now that we're breathing with three diaphragms, what you should feel is that your body is like a sausage that's enlarging from the bottom of your pelvis to the top of your chest in a wave-like fashion, like you are an undulating Michelin man. The icon of healthy breathing, the Michelin man. So now let's... Let's bring our awareness into our head. In particular, I want you to lay your tongue flat on the roof of your mouth, and I want you to actually feel the roof of your mouth with your tongue, like you were touching somebody's face with your hand.
And I want you to keep your lips closed and swallow. I want you to notice that when you do that, you generate a suction seal at your lips, as well as a suction seal between your tongue and the roof of your mouth and the tongue and your floor of your mouth. Everything just gets sucked together when you swallow with your lips closed and your tongue flat on the roof of your mouth. And now what I want you to do on your next exhalation, on your next inhalation is I want you to gently draw your tongue toward the back of your head by about one millimeter. I want you to notice that when you do this, you generate a wave of sensation that travels up the back of your head, neck and shoulders. I want you to notice that when your tongue moves back, because it's suctioned, because it's suctioned to the, to the roof of your mouth, when you pull it back, the roof of the mouth gets nudged back with it. So let the roof of the mouth go back with it and feel how that brings pressure up the back of your head, neck and shoulders, how that brings the breath right into your head because your palate is also a diaphragm. So it's capable of participating in changing the pressure gradient in your body. And even with just this one little tool alone, you should be able to avoid any future use of decongestants. Such a bad idea, such a bad idea. Just turn the pumps on in the head and your head will drain itself. So now, instead of pulling the tongue back, we're going to pull the tongue. We're going to nudge the tongue down about a millimeter. We're not going to break the suction seal, but we're going to notice that when we nudge the tongue down about a millimeter, you, put a, you induce a little flux in the palate. You induce a little flux in your palate. It kind of bows in the center. And if you do that on your next inhalation, You can also feel the breath come up into the back of your head, neck and shoulders. It's pretty cool. So now we're going to combine those two vectors. We're gonna pull the tongue back. We're gonna pull the tongue down. We're gonna pull the tongue back and down at the same time. Sorry, back and down at the same time. So we're going to generate a vector that goes kind of at a 45 degree angle towards your throat. So you're gonna pull it back and down at the same time. Right? You're going to find that produces a very rich experience of pressure gradient change in the back of your head, neck, and shoulders. Who doesn't need that? Everybody needs that. Everybody, and all, everybody who uses any kind of device on a regular basis needs that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to stop trying to move. Oh, wait. Do one more of those. Pull the tongue back and down. And I want you to notice that when you pull the tongue back and down, it scrunches your tongue. It scrunches your tongue and so your tongue gets shorter and fatter, like socks from 80s or 90s. It gets shorter and fatter and when it widens like that, when it gets fatter like that, you can feel it push on the inside of your teeth and feel it nudging your palate wider. And that makes you feel like you're about to start smiling. It makes you feel as though you have an impulse to smile. I want you to allow yourself to enjoy and experience that impulse to smile. Allow it to be there because that will help you get a better breath. So now we're going to stop trying to move the tongue and instead we're going to bring our awareness to the front of the throat right here and underneath the chin. And I want you to notice that when you inhale, Suction seal in place, especially. If you inhale, suction seal in place, but even if your suction seal isn't in place, you can feel a slight pulling sensation at the front of the throat and under the chin. And let me just tell you why. No, I'm not gonna tell you why yet. Go ahead and feel that sensation and I want you to allow that pulling sensation now, I want you to allow that pulling sensation to move your tongue for you. I want you to allow that pulling sensation to draw your tongue back and down with it. And I think you'll find that you don't actually have to intentionally move your tongue. You just have to allow it 
to be pulled by that pulling sensation. And that pulling sensation is a sensation that is generated by your anatomical structure. Your mouth is the opening of a tube. Your tongue is rooted in the floor of your mouth, which is slung across the bottom of your jaw. So the floor of your mouth is slung between your mandible and your hyoid bone, which is kind of right there at the back, the place where your chin intersects with your neck. And the floor of your mouth is where your tongue is rooted. So when the, so, so the mouth is the opening of a tube that the tongue is attached to. And as we follow that tube inside your body, we're going to call your tube your pharynx, which is also known as your throat. And then we're going to follow it deeper into your body and we're going to call it your esophagus. And then we're going to follow it still deeper and we are going to end up in your stomach. It's all the same tube. So when your diaphragm contracts and flattens and pushes your stomach down, it's going to pull the whole food tube down with it. And it's going to generate this wonderful pulling sensation at the front of your throat and under your chin. And you can allow your tongue to go back and down with it. And you can allow the breath to come up into your head without trying to do anything but start your breath at L4 and let it travel through the rest of your body. It's kind of a little jump. It's kind of a little jumping mechanism that, that goes right from, that takes the, the, that allows your breath to jump right from the spine, the front of the spine, right up into the head. It's very groovy. So now we're going to allow the whole lower jaw, your whole lower jaw to get drawn back and down with that pulling sensation. I want your whole lower jaw to go, uh, let's see, let's, you want your whole lower jaw to go back and down. It's just gonna be a little nudge. It's like the same amount of motion, about maybe a millimeter, maybe less than a millimeter of motion in your lower jaw, being pulled back and down by that pulling sensation. Just let it go along. And what I think you'll notice is that this significantly expands your experience of breath in your head. And I think you'll find that this actually brings your breath right to the very center of your head, which is where your autonomic nervous system is mastered. Who wouldn't benefit from better physiology at the source of mastery of your autonomic nervous system? Everyone benefits from that. Everyone benefits from better autonomic regulation and balance. So enjoy bringing your breath right to the very center of your head. It uh, feels like a very, like a little cooling, little effervescent disco ball of light, like a little fountain right in the middle of your head because it's very cool. It's very cool. The, the tissues cool off when you drain them. They feel cooler. When, when, you are, when, when we are uh, looking for dysfunction in the body, part of what we do is palpate for temperature change over the surface of the body. Then we know where the lymphatic congestion is in the person's body. As we improve their breathing and move that congestion, what we find is that that part of the body cools off significantly. It's really quite lovely. So now um, I want you to notice that, that, that what happens also when your whole lower jaw goes back and down is that your, the floor of your mouth gets a little flux in it. It draws in on inhalation. It puffs back out on exhalation. This little area here, this little bullfrog area, it's going to pull in on inhalation. It's going to puff back out on exhalation like a bullfrog. Um, and so, uh, so the floor of your mouth is also a diaphragm, a sheet of muscle, skin, and fascia attached to the mandible, hyoid bone. If you allow it to move, it's going to, when you inhale, as you inhale and exhale, it's going to bring breath to the center of your head. It's going to drain the center of your head for the benefit of all beings. And now what I want you to do is bring your awareness into your cheeks, the sheet of muscle, skin, and fascia attached to your mandible, your zygoma, and your maxilla. This sheet attached to a frame, sheet of muscle, skin, and fascia with a hole in it attached to a frame. 
I want you to bring your mind there, and I want you to notice that when you inhale, your cheeks hug your teeth for a moment. And as you exhale, your cheeks release your, your, your teeth. They get a little momentary hug and then they let go. Your cheeks get sucked in on inhalation. They puff back out on exhalation. Your cheeks are a diaphragm, very analogous to your pelvic floor if you think about it. It's the diaphragm at the other end of the tube. And when you allow motion like this to happen in your cheeks, now it feels like you're breathing through your entire face. Like it's not these two little holes you have to breathe through, it's this whole thing here. And I think you'll notice that your cheeks cool off considerably when you allow them to move with inhalation and exhalation as you continue to move congestion out of them. Now let's go inside the ear canals. And I want you to follow your ear canals to their medial ends. I want you to follow your ear canals to your medial ends where you know your eardrums are. Your eardrums are at the medial ends of your ear canals, this little hole here your ear. If you follow that all the way in, I know you've done it with a Q-tip, although some people pretend they've never done this with a Q-tip. If you've touched your eardrum with a Q-tip, that's right where it is. So find that region with your mind, and I want you to choose to let it be soft and relax. I want you to choose to let that area be very soft and relaxed. And I want you to notice that if you let it be soft and relaxed, as you inhale, your eardrums will be drawn toward each other, drawn into the center of your head on inhalation. And when you exhale, they drift back apart. When you do this, when you allow this motion to happen in your eardrums, it's going to feel like you can sip the breath right through your ear holes, through your external auditory meatus, it's called that little hole, that's what it's called. So you're going to feel like you can draw it right through your, your eardrums, the breath right through your eardrums. And as you do that, you may notice that this whole temporal region of your skull and the cranium and the brain inside it feels like it gets cooler in there. As, and if, Actually, if you are with a friend, you can actually reach over and um, touch your friend's temporal region and you'll probably notice that as they inhale and exhale, you'll be able to feel movement in that bone if you touch it very softly. This is true for actually any of the things we've talked about as you're trying to bring the breath up the neck with the, with the with the tongue on the roof of the mouth as you inhale. If, your hand, if you touch your friend's neck then, you're gonna feel the neck get broader, get a little fatter. You can do this with all of the diaphragms in the head. You can actually feel how you can induce motion in your head by using your thoracic diaphragm and letting everything else be relaxed. So now let's do the same thing with our temples. I want you to bring your mind to your, this area we call temples right here. And if you've, ever, uh, if you've ever seen a picture of the skull, you'll see there's like a little, a little dugout place here that muscle goes over. It's like a little circular area. There's a little cavity of bone there almost. Um, it's a fossa, that's what it's called, a fossa. And there's a diaphragm over that fossa. So if you relax your temples and allow them to move, what I think you'll notice is as you inhale, it feels like they draw towards each other. And when you exhale, they puff back out. And when you allow this motion to happen in your temples, I think you'll notice that your temp your, the frontal region of your cranium, including your brain, feels like it cools right off, which is really lovely. So now, Let's go ahead and bring our awareness now to our eyeballs. Let's bring our awareness to our eyeballs. And I want you to notice that when you inhale, if you allow your eyeballs to be soft and relaxed, and it, what will help you do this is to let your awareness be very relaxed. 
I want you to imagine, even if your eyes are closed, that you could see everything in front of your body right now. I also want you to imagine you can see everything behind your body. And that means everything in the room around you, but see then if you can actually get even more peripheral and expand your awareness out beyond the walls, maybe even beyond the building, maybe into the earth. Let your awareness be very peripheral and this will help your eyes get soft and relaxed. And as you do this, I think what you'll notice is that when you inhale, your eyeballs pull in toward the center of your head. Very subtle motion here, very subtle sensation. Not super subtle, but if you're not used to looking inside, it may be, it may be pretty subtle, but it'll just become easier and easier to feel. Eyes getting drawn into the center of the head on inhalation, let them puff back out on exhalation. Now, if you can visualize your own eyeball in your head, please do so. Feel, your, feel the, all the boundaries of your whole eyeball. Like let your awareness rush over the entire spherical surface of the eyeball. You may think that one side, one eyeball feels easier to feel than the other. If that's the case, what I want you to do is try relaxing the back half of your diaphragm on the side of the body that doesn't feel as clear or as vivid. Try relaxing that back part of the diaphragm. Really elongate those fibers, let them go, let the dome go very high there. And every time you relax the back of the diaphragm, the, the same side diaphragm more, I think you'll feel that you can actually get more freshness on that side. We'll go into that more on, in, another, in another class, but for those of you who have some understanding of that, go ahead and play with that. And now, what I want you to notice is that as you allow all these diaphragms to move inside your head, your head appears to grow in size like a balloon every time you inhale. And it deflates and retracts every time you exhale. Allow this motion to happen in your head. And now, if you're lying on your back, which I think most of you are right now, if it is okay for you to have your legs flat, go ahead and kick the, the bolster out from under your knees. If you are not comfortable with your legs flat, if that's going to make your back arch up too high, then I want you to just keep that under your knees. Um, keep it under your knees and leave your ankles resting on the floor just as they are. But what we're gonna do on our next inhalation is we're going to on our next inhalation, this is my floppy foot. We're going to lift the toes, we're going to reach through the bottoms of the feet, including the ball of the big toe. Right? I'm gonna reach through the ball of the big toe. I'm going to reach through the whole ball of the foot. I'm going to reach through the heel. I'm going to lift the toes and maybe even spread them a bit. And as I do that, I'm going to inhale. And then in a wave-like fashion, I am going to contract every muscle of the lower extremity right up to the butt cheeks and including the inner thighs. So what will happen when you do this is, oops, what will happen when you do this is that your floppy, externally rotated feet will become parallel like you're standing on the floor with your toes lifted. And when you exhale, you're going to relax everything. When I inhale, I lift my toes, I reach to the balls of my feet and my heels. When I exhale, I relax everything. And the wave of contraction comes right up from the toes to the butt cheeks and includes the inner thigh. 
and marvel at what a huge breath you can take when you add six more diaphragms to your breathing apparatus by gently squeezing all the muscles of your lower legs. It's my belief, um, I haven't proven this yet, but if you have an anatomist or a physiologist out there that needs a project to do, um, maybe they might be interested in verifying my hunch that every single muscle in your body participates somehow in diaphragmatic structure. Um, and, uh, and, and that would, in, well, every muscle in your body participates in diaphragmatic structure. So if you gently squeeze every muscle with the same amount of tension, you engage every diaphragm of the body. And this allows for massive pressure gradient change. Um, let's add the arms now. So you're lying flat on your back. Lying flat on your back and your palms are going to be turned up. So my palms turned up and what I'm gonna do as I inhale is I'm going to spread my fingers, spread my palms, make my hands into a dish-like shape. I do not want to hyperextend. Hyperextension is public enemy number two. Hyperextension is like having your umbrella turned inside out or worse, your parachute turned inside out. Diaphragms are not useful when they're hyperextended. I believe that's true. So you don't want to hyperextend your, um, your palms. You just want a nice dish shape with your hands. And so as you inhale, what you're going to do is you're going to engage all the muscles of your upper extremities, including those in your armpit. You can see how here's my armpit floppy, here's my armpit engaged. So in order to engage it, I had to engage my latissimus muscle as well as my pecs and all the other muscles of my upper extremity. So you see how I can make it deep like that. How I can make my elbow deep. I can make this little dish shape in my elbow. I can make a little dish shape in my palm. So that's what we're gonna do. But it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a rigorous squeeze. It's gonna be a gentle squeeze that we're going to use um, so that we can figure out how to bring these diaphragms online. The palm, the, pop, the antecubital uh, fossa, and the axilla the arch of the foot, the popliteal space, and the thigh pit. Um, so we're gonna inhale and squeeze every muscle of the extremity. And what you're gonna notice is that as you squeeze, your hands will naturally externally rotate a little bit. You're not flipping them over by yanking your bones around. You're just engaging and letting them be moved wherever they go, wherever the breath wants to take them. So let's combine that now. Let's combine the arms and legs, all the diaphragms in the head, all the diaphragms that we've talked about in the torso, and let's breathe with all of them. And I want you to, I don't know, take three breaths like that. And now we're going to do side to side breathing. So I want you to I'm going to do the arms and legs on the right side first, and then we'll do the arms and legs on the left side first. Okay? So, um, so you're going to do the arm and leg on the right. You're going to squeeze every muscle as you inhale. You're going to relax everything that you possibly can find as you exhale. Then you're going to go over to the other side and do it on the other side on your own breath. I think what you're going to notice is that when you alternate sides, the side that you're engaging gets longer and fatter than the side you're not engaging. 
And you're even going to notice that a larger volume of air will pass through the nostril of the side of the body that you're engaging. And you may also notice, you may have noticed um, if you're watching this video at this point, and there's no need for anybody who's doing this right now to sit up. If you're watching this and saw me do this in front of the screen, you may notice that there's actually a shifting that happens in my body as I inhale more on one side than the other. Um, everybody else in the room, you just keep breathing right and left side, okay? And you can watch this later, but the screen makes it pretty easy to see how much my body shifts from one side to the other as I alternate sides. And that's not a result of me leaning. That's a result of the fact that the pressure is pushing me places because that's what pressure does. So now I want you all to take one breath with all the arms and legs. Actually, go ahead, take three breaths with all the arms and legs. And when you're done taking those breaths, go back to breathing with just your thoracic diaphragm. And as you do this, you're gonna let every, all the effort go from your arms and legs. You're gonna just have your thoracic diaphragm, let the breath come in at L3, L4, let it roll up to the top of the lumbar spine, let it ripple out, let it touch all the borders of your diaphragm. And now I want you to bring your awareness into your armpits. And I want you to notice that at the end of a really nice exhalation, a really surrendered exhalation, that your armpits get dragged into your chest just a little bit, like a little jelly, like little jellyfish swimming into your torso as you exhale. At the very end of exhalation, they lift in. As you start to inhale, they puff back out. And as you rotate your awareness from your armpits to your elbow, antecubital fossa, or to your palms, that you might feel a fuzzy disc shape of sensation in that area that continues to undulate as you inhale and exhale. You may find the same thing is true with your thigh pit, your knee, the back of your knee, also called the popliteal space, and the arch of the foot. That as you, um, as you, uh, af now that, that we've moved these diaphragms with, uh, you know, a harmon a har in a harmonious fashion with each other, we've cleared a lot of congestion from those tissues. As a result, the tissues are more supple because they're more supple, they're more inclined to continue moving as a result of pressure gradient change from the thoracic diaphragm alone. You don't actually have to yank on them um, to get them to move. You can breathe with your whole body without doing anything but allowing the breath, allowing the pelvic floor to drop and bring in the breath from L3, L4 and let it roll up the spine and ripple out and touch all the tissues of your body which is swell. So, um, and I think we can just have you go ahead and keep taking some breaths like this. And when you're ready, um, you can start to just move your fingers and toes and make small movements first, larger movements second. And gradually um, you can come back to seated and, and we can, answer any questions you might have with regard to what we've covered today. So. And as everybody's doing that, I will um, chant Om Shanti 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 um, to end this little practice we did and then we can go into question and answer session. Oh Shanti Shanti 
Shanti. So thank you. And by the way, I didn't say this before, but this, uh, the credit for this image, we'll, we'll put it at the end of the video. So anybody who wants to uh, look at this image or, or where this image came from, it's a beautiful image of the thoracic diaphragm. Oops, sorry. Love it. Thank you, Netter, for all of your wonderful contributions to our understanding of ourselves. Um, so uh, we will go ahead and, um, and put this, uh, the credit for this so you can uh, link to it at the end of, of the video somehow. Somebody's going to help me do that. I know it. Um, any questions for me? Oh, everybody can unmute themselves. Do, do you unmute all? Unmute all. Yes. Okay, super. Let's un there we go. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Unmute you. All right, any questions today? Any questions? Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome so much. This is my pleasure. I do love to talk about breathing. Probably <laughs> a little obsessively. Question. Please. Um, so first of all, I'm such a fan. I fully believe and I really want to promote you're getting this out to 108,000. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Is that the goal? Um, Million thousand, darling. Um, Minimum. <laughs> somebody or other. We've got a lot of people that improve their breathing. Yeah. And I, I fully, fully, just in every fiber of my being, it resonates with me what you're doing. So I have to start there and at the same time express that for the longest time I've felt in my solar plexus, um, uh, that's, that that's where my block is. That's where my... Um, it's just tension is stored. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm doing this, I'm trying to be gentle with myself in noticing that my, my thoracic diaphragm isn't moving a ton. And I'm wondering, is there, is, is it a thing that maybe some people get their thoracic diaphragm like locked up somehow? Oh, absolutely. And there's a number of ways in which that could happen. I mean, that could happen, that could happen from, uh, It's, it's a very common place because you have to understand, oh gosh, you know, I'm just going to have to figure out, I'm going to have to get somebody who's way more technologically savvy than me because I want to show you pictures. Um, I think a lot of, the, there's so many reasons. Any reason that there might be congestion in this area here, in this area here, will give you um, like tension in your solar plexus. So there's a lot of structures right here that are very important. Um, your pericardium, for example, is, this, is the case that goes around your heart. It's a fascial case around your heart. On many people, the pericardium gets very congested. And that makes it, because of the, the nature of the pericardium, it comes down, it hangs from the base of the skull, just like your esophagus does, in a bag of fat. It's a bag of fascia, it comes down, and, it, and it, it's contiguous with the fascia around, your, uh, around the top of your diaphragm. So they're kind of, the structures are kind of, you know, there's really no end to any place in the body in the beginning to another. Everything is interrelated. So when the pericardium is stiff, it's going to keep everything in that area from moving well. It's going to restrict the motion of the thoracic diaphragm. That's going to, in, in turn, cause everything that is below it, like your liver, like your uh, your your hepatoduodenal ligament, like all of these wonderful structures, all of my favorite structures. Sorry, I'm a bit of an anatomy geek. But all of my favorite, so many favorite structures are right here. And they get, and they all, if they're not, if the diaphragm isn't moving well, they're not getting good compression release. And so the fluid builds up in them and they develop a lot of turgor pressure, a lot of stiffness. So what I find is this, that when you find a place where there's a restriction, wherever that place is, I want you to imagine that you could, every time the breath comes in, think of it like a wave coming in from the ocean and washing around a rock, right? Mm -hmm. um, washing around a rock at the edge of the ocean. And it kind of carves out the space around the rock as everything else softens and gets swished away. Well, 
that restriction, that the, and then as your, as your inhalation washes around that restriction, you can then discover the borders of that restriction, the boundaries of that restriction, all, all three-dimensional boundaries. Once you have that, this is what I like to do with people, and it's, it's a lot easier to do when you can put your hands on somebody to do this, but this is what the blue balls are really great for. <laughs> Funny statement, but, but you get these little squishy blue balls, right? Um, and, and the Pilates room can tell you where to get them. I'm not sure where they get them. But, um, but you can put those over a restricted area and practice letting the breath ripple to that area. And, and the way this works, it's kind of interesting. Your body is basically a bunch of pressure columns. So if I have a restriction, let's say my restriction, well, let's be real. Where's one of some of my restrictions? Right here. So I have a restriction right here. So I tend to get restricted here. These tissues tend to get hard on me. This is, this is old for me, it's chronic. When I want to soften this area, and people can mash on this all day long and it might not change. Unless, unless it's Joe Cleary or Jushri mashing on it and then it will probably change. But, but for the most part, massage won't touch this. But what will touch this is if I relax this part of my diaphragm. Do you see my two hands here? Do you see both hands? Mm -hmm. If I relax the part of my diaphragm that is directly below that spot. So as I inhale and the breath comes up and then it starts to spread out, what you'll notice if you're touching somebody, if you have a hand up here and a hand here, is that as soon as you allow this ripple to Fully, fully engage this area as fully as you can, because this is probably restricted. If this is restricted, this is probably restricted. So I want to allow this area to become as inflated as possible on inhalation. And what you'll feel when you feel the, the pressure come in here is you'll feel it shoot right up to here. It's almost like there's a direct column. As soon as it travels here, it comes right up the, the back, up to the top, right up really the top of the head. It also will simultaneously go down. So if my restriction, can you still see me? My, if my restriction is here, I relax the same part. So this entire column of the body is actually going to be drained by the part of the diaphragm that corresponds with it in a vertical fashion. Nice. And, and, uh, and, what was the end? And so when you really allow it to puff up on your inhalation, I want you to imagine that you could just take a little bicycle pump hose and stick it right into the restricted area. And as you really elongate the fibers directly below it, you're going to feel it deflate. I mean, as, as you elongate, you're going to feel that it's like, it's like you had a balloon and you blew it up a little further with the hose, the bicycle pump hose. You inflate it, the whole thing, a little bit as you inhale. The whole restriction gets a little bigger as you inhale, right? Going right up from the diaphragm to that spot, gets a little bigger. Then it's like, think of it like you have a balloon that you added pressure to, added a little pressure to it. It was already full, you added pressure to it. Then you're gonna let the pressure out. <laughs> by relaxing right there, focusing on relaxing wherever you, you know, wherever you, the corresponding part of your diaphragm, you're gonna relax it right there. You're gonna let the added pressure out, but then since you know how to keep letting it out is just keep relaxing that spot on your back and you'll feel the tissues soften. It's kind of crazy how well it works. Um, obviously it's easier if you have uh, somebody's uh, hands there and they can, guide you but at the same time you know I, I think that right now we all need to work on self-healing we all need to work on how to be able to heal ourselves right um you know like like our world's our, our toxic burden isn't getting any less right now or maybe it is well nobody can go to work but <laughs> i don't know how long they're going to stay away from work and uh and the thing is, it doesn't matter if the restriction's on the front of your body or the back. I will say that, generally speaking, 
If you're trying to drain, use the back of your bone. So if my restriction is here, I'm going to draw a line down and go to that part on the back, on the back of the body, because most, your, your, your lumbar region here is like a big delta. This is a big delta. Most, most of your compression release happens here and all the fluids from your lower body are going to aggregate as they come up and they're gonna collect right here. And then they hop into a little tube that takes them right up here. This is where the lymph jumps back into your circulation from your th this left thoracic duct from your lower body. This whole upper left body is going to be, is going to drain into the same spot here. My whole upper right body drains into this spot over here on the right side. So we're trying to move the fluid back into the thoracic ducts and then back into the circulation. If an area is restricted, it's congested. But I guess you ask a water bender what the problem is and they're always going to think it's a fluid problem. Somebody else may understand it differently than you. <laughs> um, did that answer your question? I mean, yeah. Anything in that area can be tight and restricted. And, and you can even, and, and let me say, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to take up so much time on this one question, but uh, it, it helps us get at a lot of other things as well. Um, your body is a colloid, so it acts like a colloid, right? A colloid is a suspension of particles in a fluid matrix. And so that, like quicksand is a colloid, like the ocean is a colloid, like a cup of cornstarch with water in it is a colloid. If you jab at a colloid or you smack a colloid, a colloid will harden. Your body, the tissues of your body are a colloid, so they act like a colloid. If they take an impact or a tearing force um, or even an emotional trauma rests in a particular part of your body, it will harden. Healthy tissues are soft, they're supple, they're mobile. Diseased or dysfunctional tissues are hard and restricted. And so they're not going to move as well, right? And, but if, if, you, if you jab the cornstarch, it'll harden under your finger. But if you set your finger on top of the cornstarch and just let it sink in slowly, it acts like a liquid. So if we interface with our tissues as if they're liquid, and we touch them soft and we, and we allow the breath to touch our whole body softly, it will liquefy things again for us. Does that make sense? I think a lot of times when we like rip on our body super hard, you know, unless you're doing it with a great deal of precision, right? You're gonna make them harder, right? And, one, and, and there's, you know, other ways that you can interface with the collar and soften it as well, but, um, but that's kind of what we have to be thinking about is how do we soften these tissues and, and, and gently engaging them in tidal north will soften them just like the ocean will erode the shore. Okay, I know that was a long answer, but did that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. And, 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 if, you, and uh, if, if you wanna talk more specifically about that, um, I'm happy to. Let me just see if anybody else has any other questions right now. Any other questions right now? Please. Hi, Christine. Thank you so much. That was really incredible. Um, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I, so I had an experience at the beginning that was kind of interesting, and I just wanted to ask you if that's a common thing to happen. Um, once I started breathing um, more deeply, I felt a lot of pressure on my nose. You felt what? Pressure on my nose. Like on the top of it? Yeah, it just kind of it felt like my it felt like my nose was like uh like there was just a little bit of pressure on it or something. I don't know, maybe the breaths were really big and it was all coming out of my nose. Did did it continue? No. Then my guess is you may have had some kind of congestion there that you moved. Hmm. I mean so the, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the experience and also tears started coming out of my eyes. 
it was like pressure here and then i had tears kind of like one or two just like come out of my eyes and then it moved so maybe it was congestion but it was interesting and i thought i would ask you that was common kind of fun yeah it's probably just it was probably just congestion and who knows i mean was there any emotional content to it mm -hmm. yeah there was kind of an emotional um uh like welling that happened and then it kind of moved and then i felt really open so, Yay! Yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, the thing is, you know, like that. I, I, I those sorts of things are not uncommon. Mm. Maybe not that one specifically, but if you had a lot of pressure here for whatever reason, I mean, even stress could cause that. Like, just normal American stress. But you know, any any. <laughs> Any type of holding that you do generally goes along with emotional, some type, has some type of emotional content, and much as I don't like to admit it. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, but that's good. That means you're moving stuff. I'm, um, and by the way, um, I, uh, I'm also really open to feedback because I want this to be something that's beneficial to people. And uh, one of the participants yesterday told me that she, she said in our, um, like this, this is one that's more like kind of technical and explaining how stuff works. But she was saying that she would like for the practices that we're doing on the three other days of the week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays to be, um, more sensory based and less sort of review of the technicalities. Uh, and I thought that, that at least, you know, 50% of the time we should do it that way, maybe more, maybe all of the time, because it seems like a good idea, but we really want people to also have really great um, understanding. And so um, I'm, I kind of want people to do this, part of the reason I'm kind of doing some teaching in the practices is because I don't always know that people remember the anatomy and physiology stuff um, well enough throughout the, uh, the week, but it might make it so that, but what I'm saying is I'm really thinking about what she's saying in terms of how to structure my things. So if anybody else has any great ideas or experiences or uh, comments, ideas, how we could make this better, um, please tell me because because I want to know. I want to make it more better. Anything else? Did I did I answer your question? Me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Any other questions? Quick question. Um, I was just curious. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that you would recommend taking nine breaths in the morning. Is there a reason that it's nine? <laughs> <laughs> Well, nine is my favorite number. Oh. <laughs> you look at <laughs> <study. laughs> Nine's my favorite number, but it also just happens to be that nine has like, you know, for people who understand more things than I do, nine has a lot of uh, numerological uh, significance. Like it's a number of completion in many numerological uh, uh, things, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, and so nine has a, has, has a lot of significance to me, so I always do everything in sets of nine, but that's my own little quirky thing. If you really want to do 10 breaths in the morning, <laughs> six or 11 or 12, all of those are fine too. I choose nine because, you know, I always, I, you know, I, I like to do things in, hunt, in sets of 108, whether it's like push-ups or sit-ups or anything like that. And so, so uh, but if I can't do 108, then I do 27 or 36. It's, it's actually entirely probably my particular quirkiness. So don't worry about that so much. It seems like a good number to do at least, and at least of. And, um, and actually, I don't just want you, I, you know, since, since we're all on pause, until they tell us we don't have to be on pause anymore, or at least we are in this state. I don't know about wherever you guys are. Um, well, we might as well do nine breaths with just the thoracic diaphragm when we first wake up, and then let's do another nine with our arms 
our arms and legs. And then let's do nine more on each side of the body, alternating sides. Um, and then do nine more um, <laughs> with just the thoracic diaphragm and notice how moving the arms and legs and alternating sides changed your experience um, and, and allows your breath to be bigger and easier. Remember, easier is just as important as bigger. Gentle and easy is as important as bigger. I have a quick question. Please. I think, um, I think it's quick. My part's good. Uh, so the, I heard you say that clenching is not something that should be like a regular practice or a forever practice, but it's helpful to learn. Mm -hmm. I found that um, when I was doing the left and the right clenching, I could finally easily feel the pelvic floor falling mm -hmm. out and in. And as soon as I stopped, I lost sight of it. And, the, the, and that basically all of the work that we were doing until we started doing the left and the right, I felt like I was getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And I actually had to stop at one point, like roll out my legs because it was, they were so painful. And then Wait, once I started doing the left and the right, it felt like I began to be getting some relief. Oh, so doing right side made you tighter. No, no, no. I Everything, sorry. Everything felt like it was from the very beginning. I felt like as I was relaxing, my legs were getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Mm. And the deeper I relax and and got in touch with the spine and my breath, my legs were getting tighter and tighter and more painful and more painful. And and until I like rolled them out. Rolled them out huh. And then when we did the left and the right side, I felt like there was release there and I could, and the relaxation was more thorough. Maybe but you I should start to, with you know, that. Okay, but I don't want to overdo it if it's not supposed, if we're not supposed to do it. I want to do it right, you know? Well, here's what I would say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change your choice of words. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna change it from clenching to gently squeezing. Okay. Gentle engagement, gentle engagement. Gently engage every muscle. Okay. Right, because we're, uh, but I would, I would say that that start with right and left. Okay. Um, and see if that helps you enter into it in a way that 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 helps to get things moving, get the 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 baseline tension moving, so that um, it doesn't have to be a painful experience up to that point. And then, were you able to once you went back into uh, breathing with uh, just the thoracic diaphragm? Did it stay relaxed? Sort of, yeah. Yeah. Try try doing another session today, but okay. but but start with the right and left, and maybe maybe um, maybe uh, we can make a recording that's just for you that uh, that starts you with the right that that starts you that way. Okay. Okay, I'll try it alone and see if it's enough if I can figure yeah, it out. And maybe we can make another recording, and 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 even though it'll be just for you, it'll be available to anybody else who may have your situation. Okay. Um, in terms of, of because because generally speaking if things are if things are um, I, muscles are really smart muscles are smarter than me um, they're smarter than any doctor for sure um, so when a muscle is tight I tend to think that the muscle is tight for a reason I you know muscles even though they um, you know, the skeletal muscles, we think of it as voluntary, and we don't think, well, they're not going to move unless I tell them to move. The truth is, they are deeply connected into your neuromuscular system. And, and so if the body detects that there's a problem somewhere, like let's say, I don't know, let's say you were playing basketball, um, and you jumped up and rapidly went from flexion to extension to slam dunk the ball and when you did that you yanked on everything everything went from here to here so rapidly that let's say your aorta and your iliac arteries which are down here aorta comes down bifurcates and goes off this way that all these arteries when you rapidly extend it um which this can happen actually as birth trauma too, these arteries got a yank on them, right? And let's just say that these arteries 
once they got yanked, now, because they're a colloid, like everything else is a colloid in you, now they're hardened and they're irritated. They're not, they're, they're, it's not that they're pathological in the sense of like, it's not that there's a blockage there or that there's an aneurysm or dissection or some big bad, scary, big bad thing, but the, the, the actual tissue, the structures of the tissues have hardened. Mm. And, you're, and the aorta, the muscles regard the viscera, like the organs, the arteries, veins, nerves, they regard the stuff that's inside as more valuable than themselves. So they will sacrifice themselves for the benefit of your internal organs or anything uh, like that in your body uh, all day over, uh, they, they will sacrifice themselves for that purpose. So if you find that by relaxing your muscles that a pain gets worse, that, that indicates to me that perhaps there's something like below the muscle that is still, it ha has so much tension on it. And when you relax the muscles, now that tension is being revealed. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is so, that so that's, that's, that's going to be the, the area of exploration. But if it helps to do right and left side, and it makes sense that it would, start with right and left side right now. I'm, I'm all about this practice being as easy and soft as possible. You know, a lot of pranayama that people do is very vigorous. And, and I, at this point in my life, don't really teach any other kind of pranayama besides complete yoga breath because I think that the potential for people hurting themselves um, is really great. And I don't know that I have a uh, good enough mastery of those practices to be teaching them to other people. And what I think is, but, but what I do think about them, but I do feel like I can say is that you're welcome. Um, bye. I hope you have a great day. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, what I do think it is true is that um, where was I, is that if you don't know how to recruit your entire thoracic diaphragm and generate holistic pressure, um, uh, compression, decompression of all the structures in your body as a result of this one fluid wave-like motion, that it's quite likely that when you start doing really vigorous breathing, you know, like a Bastrika or Kapalabhati and then you're putting your whole body under pressure, that areas of your body that weren't really moved but because you, you weren't really using your whole thoracic diaphragm, so you weren't getting holistic compression release of everything. Some areas are just getting more and more pressure buildup and going further out of balance while these other areas are getting lots of turnover. And I think that the, there is a potential for you to um, drive yourself into greater imbalance if you do vigor, uh, really vigorous pranayama before you have, um, before you have uh, good control over um, and I, I think it has a potential to drive you into a kind of, uh, I don't know, well, I, I won't go there right now, but I think it has a potential to uh, get you further out of balance if you don't first start with this holistic and I think very human type of breath um, because it's very gentle and natural for our bodies to do it. So I think it's a very human uh, breath practice. And I think if we don't start here, um, we can, we can put ourselves somewhat out of balance and put more pressure on some organs than we want because they're not being adequately drained and yet we're, anyway, do you kind of get what I'm saying there? Totally, yeah. So, so, so gentle is good, gentle is good. And when we go into taking this into movement and we show how that you can actually generate yoga postures and structure uh, with, with the breath in a very uh, noticeably hydraulic kind of way. I think that um, what you'll notice is that uh, less and less do you find yourself stretching um, any muscles because you'll be able to release them rather than try to force them to elongate. Um, if you let your breath do the work, um, they will elongate by themselves and you won't feel that oh, my hamstrings are so tight or my, my groin muscles are so tight, I can't do this. You'll feel more like, oh, here's, uh, I'm going to sail myself into deeper extension or flexion. But that will come. That will come. First, we have to get 
more mastery of the thoracic diaphragm. That's a good promise. Mastery, mastery is a big word. I'm going to back away from that word. More conscious <laughs> confidence. I'm sorry, what did you just say? I just said that's a good promise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and we can work on doing a, a right and left side thing. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Any other questions? Super. Well, this is so fun for me. I thank you all so much for coming out to play and participate and play my silly little internal games. <laughs> I was always trying to get my sister to play along with all of my games. She would often have no part of it. I'd have to go throw the frisbee up in the air so it would come back to me. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, thank you to everybody. Any, and uh, um, I have office hours. When are they, friend? Um, so what we're doing now besides this class thank you Dean. is four days a week we have Tuesday Thursday Saturday are practices of this breathing and they're just a half an hour long with some questions maybe after um, and she's doing them lying down sitting up and standing that's what we experimented last week but Wednesdays also at the same time 11 Eastern uh, daylight time is office hours what we call so you can ask questions and she'll just be there for, if you have questions about the breathing, questions about other stuff with your health, anything. It is a group, so it'll, nothing that's too, you know, that you don't feel comfortable about uh, with a group, but anything you want to ask, she's there. I'm there and I, and I love to talk about- What's that? Anatomy. And I love to talk about anatomy. So, um, so I'm, 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 I'm all about, yeah, right. if you just want to talk about anatomy, I'm like, let's look at the eye. I'm like, let's look at the eye. Let's do that. That's a great idea. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, you know what? I have to tell you this funny story. I was pulling up behind this car that was parked at the intersection outside my office in the school here. And they were pulling into the fancy health club across the street. Um, they were going to be pulling into the fancy, health, but they were about to turn left at the intersection in front of me. And they had this bumper sticker on the back of their car that said, honk if you love histology. For those of you who don't know, histology is the study of, of tissues. So it's like, it's the study of, it's like where you look at things under a microscope and you look at the different cells and stuff like that. That's histology. I mean, what kind of a nerdy bumper sticker is that? But before I could do anything, before I knew what I was doing, I was laying on the horn. My dad was a pathologist, right? So I was doing histology when I was four or five years old. I'm laying on the horn. I love histology. I love histology. <laughs> I realized they probably thought I was honking at them to go faster around the corner. So I felt really bad. I felt like I was rude. So I followed them into the fancy health club. <laughs> oh my God. And they probably thought I had total road rage. <laughs> I had to follow them right up to their parking spot. And, and then as they were backing in, these two women, you know, backing into their parking spot. And I, and I rolled down my window. I pull up next to roll down my window. And they looked over at me like they were kind of scared. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to be rude. I just love histology. <laughs> and they like looked at each other and they went, and they all, they both started laughing. We had our nerdy moment with each other, but God, that was really, so anyway, I was just sharing. Thank you for my funny story. Uh, <laughs> I want that bumper sticker. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess if there's no other questions, office hours are Wednesday at 11, correct? Was it 11? And the other classes are Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday at, also at 11. New York. And we're trying to, this weekend, I've been toying around with how I should teach about postures for using, uh, for standing and, and lying down. Um, so I'm trying to make a video of that today. Um, I kind of need uh, somebody to, to uh, I need- I Hold need, it. I need a millennial. I need a millennial to help me with these things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're gonna try to get those out uh, before the end of the weekend. So, so check back with us so that you can have those because it'd be great if I don't have to take that time to during the, the things to review it. Maybe we can, I don't know how we can do that. Maybe just have like a little tag at the beginning, depending on what day it is so that people can like tune into it when they, when they are in the waiting room or something like that. Um, if they need to. 
Well, the other thing is uh, millennial. That's we are just, this is our first completion of a week using Zoom. So we've learned a bunch of stuff, but um, uh, one of which is that it starts recording immediately when you go into a room. So because we don't have the time to edit since we're doing so many classes now, today is the only one that really I, I, I hope I don't think we'll have, like I just pressed the record button at the very beginning. That means I can just upload it immediately to our um, YouTube channel. The other ones from last week, I think, unless we get a millennial to um, edit, <laughs> we're not going to bother. But we were thinking we could also show all these, like she can record short videos. We can load them to YouTube that we can just let people know as we're making our weekly email announcements that like, yeah, go to YouTube and there will be a, a preview if you want to just watch that before the class starts or after, whatever, you know, there's plenty to watch online right now. So as we wish to, we shall watch. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Love you so everybody. much. Bye, JD. Bye, Denise. Bye, Carol. <laughs> Bye, Eli. And Bye, Pam. Thanks Thank for showing Bye, up from California. Bye, 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 Pam and Nate. <laughs> everybody have a great day. Do lots of breathing. Yes. We should talk sometime, JD. Yes, I was gonna. I was gonna see if you uh, if you had ever contacted my friend Marie. I haven't yet. I would love to. Would you send well, me let's, number? Let's definitely. Let's definitely talk. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I can get, get started on that. Send me a text, okay, and let's and let's talk.